share screen. All right, so this is our um, beginning of our antibiotics. Susceptibility, we have uh, two chapters, 10 and 11. We're going to um, introduce MicroScan today with our gram positive that we set up last week. We will identify it with a, you know, hey, let's, if it's yellow or red or if it's cloudy or clear. And then we're going to move into our susceptibility from the microscans point of view. So you'll have a worksheet that will not only give you the ID, but you, then you go and look at the sensitivity of all the antibiotics that are on that panel. So we're actually going to move straight into that. Uh, we'll bring that back again. Um, probably next week too. I think it has us going into mycology next week. And I think I want to spend one more week on uh, susceptibility testing. We have those uh, gram negative MICs that don't have an ID to it, so we can set those up. So what I want to do is bring in some real samples again um, and do that, kind of do a two, two step to finish up the susceptibility with the gram negative panel. That's if we have enough inoculums system. We're kind of running running out of those. I think we ended up started with 50 and we've done two labs already or we got 100 we've done two labs. But today is introduction to the antibiotics. We'll start simple and we'll build upon it to the end where we're going to get kind of complicated at the end of the lecture today and then we will continue on Thursday with this topic and probably um, maybe one more day in the next week, I think. I haven't decided yet, but um, I think we have, what, this is 16, 17? 17, 18, 19, 20, and then a test, right? So we're trying to finish up next. I don't want to introduce mycology until we're through with this unit. So that's the plan. Y'all have any questions on that? Good. Now we got Tristan. He thought we got connected. So antibiotics, of course, if you're in immunology, right, we don't want to make the simple as rookie mistake of thinking that these are produced by the B, B lymphocyte plasma cell and they sound the same, so they must be the same, right? Hopefully you're not there. Hopefully you're past the rookie mistake there. So these are, these are the therapeutics. This is what we're given by the doctors. These are the shots or tablets or capsules that we're given liquid form for kids. So this is how we treat infection. This is how we treat the microorganisms that you've learned all semester up to now, the pathogenic ones. Now we're going to start treating them. So when we had that part, you remember I said at the very beginning, I didn't know how I was gonna go about did we need to introduce these, you know, each week? Did we need to put, you know, did we put them in? And we did talk a little bit about it, but now we're, I think it, it works this way. I think I like it this way, waiting to the end to kind of attack them. So I didn't want to attack them while we were introducing them. I wanted to become friends. And now we're going to try to attack them and kill them. Okay, so that, that's what we're doing. So you, you go from everything to, um, the understanding that there is resistance that develops. What does it mean to go five days with a dose of antibiotics versus 10 days of an antibiotic? So we're going to harp on that just a little bit. Now that's our strategy. That's on Thursday. But we're going to talk about the mechanism of how the antibiotic works. Okay, what makes it effective against our organisms that we've been talking about? So we good? We understand where we are, right? We understand this is not the B lymphocyte produced antibody IgG, right? Okay. Because it gets, you know, your family members are going to come up and go, oh, y'all are learning about antibodies today, right? No, it was antibiotics today. 
All right, so what makes an ideal antibiotic? The compound should have these characteristics. It should be selective toxicity, meaning you don't want it to kill everything, okay? You don't want it to, you know, get after everything that we have in our body and we end up causing harm. The host must not become sensitive or allergic to the compound. So we're going to talk about sensitivity and allergic reactions. We don't want that. So, you know, that's the first thing we'll ask our patient, you know, are you allergic to anything? Right? And penicillin seems to get thrown out there quite a bit. Um, I like to say that I'm sensitive to erythromycin. That's one of mine that I like to throw out there. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit. We have organisms should not become resistant. Okay, so if it's ideal, that means it's pretty effective and we're not worried about resistance right off the bat. So it would be something good to try first. The compound should be effective against a wide variety of microorganisms. Meaning if it's a broad spectrum is what you might have heard. Like, oh, this is a broad spectrum. We're really not, we don't really know exactly what you got. So we're just gonna give you a broad spectrum antibiotic that will take care of a many that you may have. That if we do up the dose, it doesn't exhibit any side effects, doesn't cause any side effects. The compound should be water soluble, meaning it doesn't need to be absorbed into the blood. So we don't, we want it at certain places, so we want it to circulate. So we don't want it to be um, being excreted too fast, being absorbed, being held up because those, those, those should be a dose half-life that goes away. You know, like, do I take it every four hours, three times a day? Do I take it every six hours, twice a day? Do I take it once a day? So we have different, um, dosing prescribed um, for each one. We don't want it, to, uh, it is not inactivated by the plasma component. So we don't want it to be, oh, we're gonna give you this and we hope it makes it past uh, the inactivation that your blood may do to it once it's absorbed in. It should be possible to maintain high levels of the agent not readily metabolized, which means that we're buying time. So really what we want it to do is have time to circulate, okay? So it has to kind of have time to find its area of treatment. So you can think of this like, you know, if you have a cut and they give you oral antibiotics, right? And you're like, well, how in the world is that gonna help, right? Because it's, it's able to circulate. So it's gonna find its way to your area. You don't have to, you know, oh, it's on my arm, so I must put the salve externally and have it absorbed through the skin. You know, we do have some that will circulate and find where they need to go. So here's some definitions, definitely help with the idea. And this is all on chapter 10. So if you're wondering where, where in the text it would be, it's in chapter 10. So we're backing up from where we've been, going back. And that's why I said, well, it's introduced at chapter 10. Should we introduce it earlier or should we wait? And I kind of like this waiting. I think so. So bacteriostatic. Okay. And this is a lot about what people say about antibiotics. You're in immunology. So you're learning what your immune system needs, right? What does your immune system need once you get an in invader? What does it need? We don't automatically start producing stuff, right? What does it need? What does your immune system need? Time. It needs time, right? We talked about that just the other day. It needs time to, it needs two, two weeks sometimes. It needs a week. It needs that time. So what happens is this bacterial static of an antibiotic it inhibits growth. Okay, so it may not just come in and destroy the organism. It may just prevent it from dividing and growing and spreading. And then that gives your immune system time. And then boom, right? Now it's gone.
but your immune system has to come in. It has to come in and clean that up. It has to come in. So actively growing organisms are affected the most. Host defense must also be relied on to eradicate. So this is not, hey, oh, we don't have to worry about our immune system. So we must give the patient all this antibiotic and that's gonna be the key. So if somebody's immunosuppressed and you give them an antibiotic, still may be problems. It still may not be what we expect. The mind might still struggle to clear an infection. Think of that with a diabetic patient, right? Diabetic patient, poor circulation. You can antibiotic them all you want. Circulation, not getting to the area where the infection is, they end up losing a toe or a foot or a lower leg or below the knee, right? And that's what happened. That circulation is needed to move that immune system to that area. We do have some that are bacterial cytal, meaning it's going to kill the organism. So it's going to come in and actually weaken the organism to the point where it's not going to be able to survive. So that's the big two, bacteriostatic versus bacterial cytal. Hopefully you understand that. Selective toxicity. The ability to affect the microbe adversely with about, without affecting the host, right? And just, we, we don't want to go toward death just to get rid of an infection. We don't want to have to worry about our kidneys shutting down because we're treating with a potentially toxic antibiotic. And that's some of the things that we do. We test, you and lab. You're going to run levels and monitor levels of their treatment, of the patient's treatment. We think about vancomycin, we think about genomycin, we think about peaks and trough, and that's where we'll hear that. We'll hear peak and trough, and we'll go over that on how we judge when to draw. Phlebotomy and in, in, in uh, principles, did y'all talk about drawing peaks and troughs and how you guide that? Because it's very confusing. It can go years in a hospital with confusion on that. Nurses are ordering it. Doctors, well, doctors are ordering it. Nurses are translating it. And the lab just says, okay, <laughs> that's what I do. Send the phlebotomist before the next dose. And then the pharmacist says, no, I wanted that drawn after that dose. So we'll talk about peaks and troughs. Because that's, that's something we need to know. The antibiotic, the substance derived or produced by microorganisms that are able to inhibit the growth of my, other microorganisms. So we actually are going to see where these are derived from. So we're going to start off with the first one. The first one is the antibiotic that affects the cell wall. So we've spent, what, what week are we in? Eight, nine, ten, what week are we in? I don't know. Y'all know what week we're in? Y'all counting it down? Y'all scratch off your calendar every day, like, like a prison term. Do you do that? I used to do that when I was in college. I used to X out each day of the calendar, like, oh, it's only, only got eight more lectures of micro left, right? Y'all do that? This is week 11. Week 11, thank you. This is week 11. So we've spent 11, or we've spent 10 weeks talking about cell wall, right? So you should be very familiar with the cell wall of your organisms. Well, these antibiotics we're going to start with are the ones that affect the cell wall. The penicillins. Okay, we'll start there. Might as well start with the first one. Start there. So this is, uh, this is the antibiotic number one. It's penicillin. Alexander Fleming. Hopefully you've heard during intro micro about Alexander Fleming. It should have been like that very first chapter, kind of where they mentioned names of people. Okay. Isolated penicillin from a mold in, with the genus of penicillium. And how did they do that? What, what was the key? What was the, the, the noticed, what was the observation that led to this discovery? Am I remember? Just kind of packed it on to a wound and all of a sudden it healed up kind of thing, right? That's kind of an accidental discovery. It's being treated to be used as a covering and then all of a sudden it was noticed that it was actually healing the, the wound in a very good way. 
penicillium. Uh, structure, the structure of penicillium, the actual structure of the penicillin is a thiazolidin ring, thiaz, is that it, Thia, thiazolidin ring. More importantly, a beta lactam ring, and then a side chain R. So you finally know why you went to, to organ. All right? Correct? Has anybody been to organic already? Yeah. They talk about any of this in organic? Oh, uh, yeah, the rings. For sure. The rings, yes. So this beta lactam is kind of key in, kind of underlined, probably needs to be in red too, is because we're going to see that if you get an organism that becomes resistant to penicillin, it's going to produce something called a beta lactamase, an enzyme that messes with this ring, okay? Dismantles the ring. So here's penicillin G, and now here's our big test. So I got Heather's been to organic. Anybody else been to organic? No more hands are going up, are there? Anybody else? Gen Kim, did we? I, I think I see carbon, so I'm gonna say this. What I see nitrogen and sulfur. So where is where is the back beta lactam ring? Right? Beta lactam, where is it? the square. That's exactly right. The square right here. We're going to see that quite often. That's the beta lactam ring. So what is this out here? So there's our square. Here's another. Is that the thio the azolidin ring? And then our side chain is going to be over here. All right, so we have Iazolidin ring here, beta lactam ring here, and then our side chain here that gives us its name. So we'll, we're going to play with this structure quite often today's lecture. So what do the penicillins do? Why is it important? And we've, we've, I think we've already harped on it enough. I've given you my firsthand story of my strep throat, my strep pyogeny story that I got a little penicillin in my system and voila, strep had no chance, okay? So streptococci is definitely in the spectrum of activity, meaning that it is very effect, effective, 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 very effective, effective against strep infection. Also Neisseria is here and staph but only the staff that do not produce beta-lactamase. And now you know, all right, that's going to be our resistance to penicillin is this beta-lactamase produced by the organism itself in response to the treatment you may be chasing it with. So chemical alterations were made to the basic structure of penicillin by the beta-lactamase. Side chains, that side chain we talked about over there on the left, the penicillin G is added bulk, which renders beta lactamase enzymes ineffective and increase the spectrum of activity and include gram negative bacteria. So who wants to talk about what does this mean? What, what does this thing right here? What, what does this lead to? So if I had penicillin, and I had organisms that were resistant to it, what am I going to do from there? What am I going to introduce to the world? I'm going to develop new antibiotics. Still going to have penicillin maybe in the group, right? In the structure, but I'm going to bulk up the side chain, adding things over here, chemically adding to the, the first structure that protect that beta lactam ring and penicillin. So we call that generation. So you may hear that's a second generation penicillin. That's a third generation penicillin, fourth generation, fifth generation. Okay, so that we're working on that. So now that story leads to our stewardship introduction, which is we have to learn how to what? Protect those antibiotics, which means we need to prescribe them correctly against organisms that they're effective against. We need to 
take them, all right, in a way that protects them for the next time. So giving antibiotics, whether it be a doctor or you getting a refill, or you going to the cabinet to find one when you just have a, a sniffy cold cough, and you're like, oh, I got some good stuff in the cabinet, go take a few of those. That'll, that made me feel better last time, all right? That's what we're talking about. We're talking about understanding what, where we need to use these and how great they can be if you don't take them all the time. If you don't chase every UTI with, oh, we need to take another dose and we need to take another dose. And why isn't it clearing at this time? Oh, we need to switch to another kind of antibiotic. Let's try this one. And then it, it, it just keeps going. So the patient ends up with a chronic UTI situation in the nursing home because they've taken, 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 taken. Okay. So we can make this, right? So follow along, let's, since we're starting to introduce, and this is gonna be like our gold ticket, right? We're just gonna have worn this thing out that once you have the, when you get ready to study for your board, all you're gonna do is flip these back and forth, right? So if we take a look, we got streptococci, gram positive, right? That we said. Streptococcus, strep positives, right? We see it over there, gram positive, copsi, beta hemolysis, catalase negative, yes. Neisseria, where's Neisseria? It's a gram negative, the other side. Diplococci, Neisseria. So a gram negative is thrown right up in there. Staph, which does not produce. And we don't know which, which staph would you think? What would we go after? What, what staff are we going after? From, from lab to day, what staff are we usually going after? Aries, right? Okay. So when we think of Staph aureus, we always throw somebody in the mix here, methicillin. Okay, methicillin, if you look at methicillin, you see who? Who's this right here? That's our beta lactam marine, right? This is our, who's out here? What, do you say it one more time? Say it louder so we can all hear. Okay, and then who's out here? That's your side chain, right? So look, look at the difference between if it's penicillin G, right? Gave okay, it's a bulk. As we say, a bulk bulk. We're adding bulk. We've added some carbon side chains out here to protect the beta lactam ring. The mode of action inhibit cell wall synthesis. That's penicillin. So let's review. Let's review the steps in formation of the cell wall. The first stage is production of the peptidoglycan, peptidoglycan subunit, N acetyl glucosamine, and N acetyl meramic acid. That's the first stage. The second stage is forming carbohydrate subunits into that chain. And the last stage is cross-linking of the chains by peptide subunits. So that's how the, the, the bacteria grow their cell wall, develop their, their cell wall. Three stages. Penicillin binding proteins are the enzymes proteins needed for cell wall synthesis. The antibiotic penicillin binds these proteins and inhibits cell wall synthesis. So the building block, oops, there we are. The building block the last stage is cross-linking of the peptide subunits, all that. Penicillin binding proteins are the enzyme 
needed for cell wall synthesis. The antibiotic penicillin binds these proteins and inhibits. So binding, giving somebody penicillin takes away the bacteria's ability to finish the cell wall. Thus, there's no new bacteria. There's no growing. There's no replication. There's no increasing the numbers. So whatever's there now is, right? It's, that's it, okay? So buying time. So now we get to do a little, do you believe this or don't believe it? It's kind of like believe it or not time. So most doctors, as we say, aren't aware that some 90% of people diagnosed with penicillin allergy. I'm allergic to penicillin. I think we have a hand or two in here. How many people are allergic to penicillin in here? Nobody? I thought somebody told me they were allergic to penicillin. Huh? Carly Farmer. Carly Farmer, maybe that's where I heard. So Miss Farmer, she's allergic to penicillin or is she? Believe it or not, right? I'm sure she doesn't want to try this. But what this is actually saying is, is that if you gave her penicillin again, maybe the first time she got it had a bad episode where the doctor would label her as you bought, you need to tell people you're allergic to penicillin because you got sick when we gave it to you. That's my erythromycin story. Um, so for people who have true penicillin allergies, half will grow out in a five year period, according to the Academy for Asthma, Allergy and Immunology, believe it or not. So a lot of times what happens is we are mischaracterized with an adverse reaction, according to Dr. Natalie Azar. Someone might say they got nauseated or had an upset stomach and considered that a allergic reaction. Often it's a child when you're a child. That happens to. And this is where we have the problem is most kids maybe are coming in with a fever and they have upset stomach, they have diarrhea, they're vomiting. And thus what happens is, is the doctor goes, you know, I know they're throwing up and I know they're having diarrhea you know their ears look a little red. I don't want to make I want to make sure we don't have an infection, inner ear infection going on that could lead to sepsis and cause this patient to die. So I'm just going to go ahead and on top of your upset stomach and your diarrhea, I'm going to go ahead and give you a shot of roast seven. And they give it. And then the kid keeps throwing up. Okay. So that's what they're saying here. The kid ends up with a rash. The kid gets mistakenly saying you had an allergy to penicillin and it stays them for the rest of their life. They never change that status. So they always say, I'm allergic to penicillin. Anybody on Zoom allergic to penicillin? I didn't see if anybody raised their hand or anything. Nope. Okay. So what would be a good thing to do? You are immunologists now. What would be a good thing to do? Maybe a skin test, putting penicillin under the skin and see if it flares and wheels and reddens up, right? To a point where we could say, ah, maybe you are allergic, right? Okay, penicillin, cell wall synthesis inhibited, right? So that's number one. You find all these. Um, Save our whole list here. Let me make sure penicillin's on here. I don't see penicillin in here. Beta -lact lactams. Yeah, it's on here. It's on 163. It's under beta lactam. Penicillin, ampicillin, piperacillin. A lot of the ones we're going to see today. Then we're going to move to cephalosporin. Cephalosporin, structure similar to penicillin, 
Both still have the beta-lactam ring. The cephalosporins have a six-member dihydroxythiazine ring. Okay, so let's see if we can make that distinction. Where is this six-member dihydrothiazine ring? So here's our penicillin. Here's our beta-lactam ring. Here's our, what's this out here again? Heather? What's this? I didn't answer your earlier. Yes, or that. No, it was you. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> what's that? Uh, is it thiazolidine? Yes, okay. <laughs> so that is you what, do. that is a five member, right? One, two, three, or one, two, three, four. No, that's just a one, two, three. Out here, we got to make this six, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Does that make six? I, I, six member ring. Okay. And that's what, what is that called for cephalosporin again? Dihydrothiazine. So similar in that we have, do we have thia uh, something in the first one, penicillin? Yeah. Okay. It's thiazolidine, I think. Thia, thia, right, they both have thia. Both have beta-lactamase rings. Or beta-lactam rings, not ACE, right? We don't want to go beta-lactamase analog. So cephalosporin, there are first, second, third generations of cephalosporin were created by the addition of a different side chain. So the principle of the structure is the same except we're adding to the side chain. Beta-lactamase resistant cephalosporins have been synthesized. So we have built a cephalosporin that can resist beta-lactamase. So that's the enzyme that bacteria produces to go after these antibiotics and make them ineffective. So cephalosporin has been generationed out so that we get past the beta-lactamase ability of the, the organism. Gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. So cephalosporins, are, I would call that broad spectrum, wouldn't you? They're just effective against both. Mode of action, the antibiotic binds penicillin binding proteins again to inhibit cell wall synthesis. So the mode of action is the same, penicillin and cephalosporins. We doing okay? Is that what page 165 is talking about with the cephalosporinases, B class C? Yes, that's a whole list of them. So what Allison has said is on 164, if you look at figure 10-2, you're seeing the basic structure. You're seeing that the examples. So this is where, and, and I hate, you know, I, I told you I was going to challenge you in this section. I said, I'm going to challenge you because let's just say we don't like to be outdone by nursing. That, that's just my, my deal. And if a nurse is calling me and saying, I don't see the antibiotic that the patient is actually on, on your list of sensitivity that you just sent me. I don't see it. Okay. So the first off, that's going to tell me that's a new nurse. That's where, where I go there. I was like, oh, that must be a new nurse. She hasn't, or he hasn't learned, it's either one. They haven't learned what? The names. The what they're giving you is they're on um, Cipro. They're on oh, Rocephin, right? They're giving you the names that are brand names. And they may not know the, the real name, that we don't give brand names on our list. Maybe we should, maybe we could, right? That's something we could put in the computer, right, to help. But if I got a veteran nurse, if I got a nurse that's been uh, treating and looking at these reports for a while, I don't get those calls because they already know. 
the different names, brand name versus real name. Okay, so I challenge you to be working on that. And we don't get much of it. It's just kind of an introduction. But you are, if you're in the micro section, you're releasing that information. You are sending that report to the doc, out to the patient, doctor, whether it be from the floor, from the ER, or from outpatient. You're releasing those names. So you should be what? You shouldn't have to go look it up. You shouldn't have to go try to find it. You should be able to answer hey, just let you know that is the, that is what they're on and, and it's this one, okay? It's this one here. You can see that it is sensitive to it or it is resistant to it. And then you can say, well, I didn't realize what they were actually on. I don't get that information. So what antibiotic are they on? You can call and check, right? If you see a lot of resistance on your profile of the patient, you may call and say, just curious as to what they're on, or you can look it up. You can go in the chart and look, see what they've been prescribed, and then you can really impress them by saying, I noticed that they're on A, B, C, and I want to let you know that this one, it was resistant, the bug I found, the E. coli I found, the staph I found, the pseudomonas I found is resistant to the antibiotic they're on, meaning key informed the doctor that they're on the wrong thing. They need to switch, okay? That's our, that's our main role, that's our main goal of the day, is to be able to do that. That's what information of a sensitivity report is all about. It's not, next time, they're sensitive to everything, so just put it on it. You know, don't worry about that E. coli changing around because it's sensitive to everything. So that's what I challenge you to do. So as we work our way through these next couple of weeks, that's where I want you to start working on. I have a question. Yes. My daughter's on medication, my oldest, and she, um, like one type of insurance covers brand name, and the other one is the off brand. Is the off brand like the actual name? Is that what we're talking about here? Or is it the same thing? No. Okay. The off brand you're referring to is a generic. Yeah. Generic is manufactured by a different company, probably that has gotten away, this is how. So if I put out a new antibody and I'm the company that puts it out or a new drug of any type, what happens is, is they'll say, I own the name. I own that name, it's under whoever, name a drug company, uh, Pfizer. Pfizer owns the name. That's my brand name, that's the way I market it, that's what I tell the doctors I don't pres prescribe. They have that protection for so long and then it goes away and now generics are in play, okay? So then a generic is another company saying, I'm gonna produce that same thing, okay? That same drug and then, um, so I think I, my wife did the same thing. So called the doctor and he said, I think I put her on Macrobid last time and macrobit is nitrofuritonin. And nitrofuritonin is the actual name we're gonna talk about today. But macrobit is how the nurses will know it and how the doctors will prescribe it. They'll prescribe macrobit and the pharmacists will know. You gotta go get macrobit. But if there's a generic alternative, the label may come back as nitrofuritonin. Or it may say macrobit generic name, nitrofuritonin. So you probably still have the real name, and then this is a generic four. Is that, okay, I got to, yeah. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Google it, it tells you what yeah, that, that's the, if you're a pharmacist, it's like, right? So they're gonna be go-tos, and it's always fun to watch when a new one comes out, which isn't very often anymore, but how the doctors will switch and start writing that one. I knew the generic was the same as like the real name, but I didn't know if the generic name was just this. It's a, it it's a made up name too. Yeah, Usually so. a generic company that makes it wants to put its spin, so it, it might call it mac, macro bid or instead of mac, it might, it, it'll do something fun, you know, something yeah. similar. So you see all these similar names, uh, but then there's really an underlying drug name. 
So pharmacists all know the drug names. You guys are going to start with the drug names and then you're going to build on that. So we're going to use that today. We have a whole list of these in our little panel that we're going to look at and determine who's sensitive and resistant. Beta-lactamases are enzymes produced by bacteria that provide multi-resistance to beta-lactam antibiotics. And then here's the list that Allison went to in front of us, which is penicillin, cephalosporins, cephamycins, and carbapenems, ertapenems, er although carbanapenems are relatively resistant to beta-lactamases. So if you look at your list, you have the penicillins as a beta-lactam class, and you have examples of penicillin, ampicillin, piperacillin, and then you see the structure to the right, the base molecular structure. You got your cephalosporins, has the six-member ring to the right of the beta-lactam ring, cephazolins, cephurexamins, the cephotetins, the cepho Hexamin, uh, yeah, we got a lot of cephs. Cephazidomy and cephapamy, ep right? So it really gets wild with a lot of names. So we'll do our best. So where does bacitracin fit in? So I know we're sitting here with cephalosporins, penicillin, cephalosporins, and then bacitracin. Topical. So Bactine ointment, have you ever heard of that? Triple antibiotic ointment. So Bacitracin is a topical beta-lactam. Carbapenems. Here we go. I knew there were somewhere in here. 165. It's okay, so let's take this first one. Carbapenems, example, imapenem. So what is imapenem? Anybody wanna look that up for me? For example, so let's see if which one is which. Carbapenems and imapenem, for example. It just says it can treat bacterial infection. The brand name is Promaxin uh, 4. So ibapenem is not the brand name of the carbapenem that we're starting with, right? So it is one of the sub... It's also called Celastin. Celastin? Yeah. All right. Thank you. So make that... So what we, what we really want to do is, as we're building our list today, as we're building our list this afternoon, is we need to what I will focus on is putting them in categories as we go through them today. So we'll go through our list. We have a nice worksheet to work through, but we'll go through where they are while they're on the gram positive panel. So the carbapenems have the broadest antibacterial spectrum of activity for beta lactam antibiotics such as penicillin and cephalosporins. So Let's read that again. Have the broadest antibacterial spectrum of activity for the beta lactam antibiotics. Does that make sense? Anybody? Somebody make sense of that for me. Well, you're, yeah, you're comparing them. Like, which one would you go with? Would you go with a penicillin or a cephalosporin over a carbapenem? 
Okay, so they're highly resistant to most beta-lactamases. So if I had a beta-lactam producing organism, which we know, we can figure that one, then we would go with a carbapenem instead of a penicillin or cephalosporin. Carbapenems are one of the antibiotics of last resort for bacterial infections, especially if we have drug resistant strains like of E. coli and Klebnumo. Hmm. Do we have to say there's an alarm? This is part of the stewardship question. So how long do we battle the infection with penicillins and cephalosporins before we move to a carbapenem? Is it an automatic? Is it something we wait on? It was a shock to the system when I saw a doctor prescribe vancomycin. Because in my mind, it was like, this is like, if we can't get anything else to work, then we need to move to vancomycin. So keep that in mind. But alarm has been raised because there is resistance to carbapenems among the coliforms, the E. coli and Klebnumo or coliforms. And it's due to the production of an enzyme they've named New Delhi. Is that Delhi or go with Delhi? New Delhi. Metallo beta lactamase, a carbapenemase. So now we've got organisms that are producing a new enzyme going after carbapenems structure. And there are currently no new antibiotics in the pipeline to combat the ones that are resistant to carbapenems. So this will be a super infection, superbug, is what they might refer to this one as. You may come across the superbug in your daily activity. We don't know. We don't know what micro might do that day. Klebsiella pneumonia, carbapenem ace. This is again, resistant Kleb pneumo. That bacteria or a group of emerging highly drug resistant gram negative rod causing infections associated with significant morbidity and mortality. Infection causes, y'all know the difference between morbidity and mortality? Yay? No? Has anybody ever told you what the difference is? Y'all know it. What do you think mortality is? Death. What do you think morbidity is? How bad you how bad you are before death, right? Morbidity and mortality. How sick did you get and did you die? Infections caused by these organisms present clinicians with serious treatment challenges because we just don't have options. We've run out. The best therapeutic approach to the Kleb pneumo carbapenemase producing organism has yet to be defined. However, common treatments based on in vitro susceptibility testing are polymyxins, tigacyclines, and less frequently aminoglycoside antibiotics. So we may do what? We may figure out a combo, maybe how we treat tuberculosis, right? We may come up with a combo of antibiotics that we can prescribe to try to defeat uh, the drug, the carbana, the KPC, which is the highly resistant to the carbanapines or the carbama pins. <clears throat> so here's our penicillin. Again, the beta-lactamase antibiotics. Here's penicillin. Again, the beta-lactam ring. Carbapenems have the beta-lactam ring, and then they have this six-member. Is it six-member again? Six-member? Is that who's six-member out to the side? Cephalosporin. Okay. So do we have carbapenems on this list? They're in that figure at the very bottom. They're at the very bottom. There they are. Y'all see it down at the bottom on page 164? Okay. So again, all under the title of the beta-lactam class. The class is here. 
that's where we are. Vancomycin. Is it a beta lactam? Y'all need to see the structure. Is it a beta lactam? <laughs> no, I, don't. I see a lot of stuff, but I don't. I see a lot of different structures. Yeah, I just, but I don't see the beta lactam rings, and it is a non beta lactam. Oops, went the wrong way. So, where do we want to shoot vancomycin? Where are we going to go after? This, is, this to me is the last one. This is it. Okay, this is the antibiotic that you go to when nothing else is working and you just need the patient to get better. It's eventually, eventually not going to be that if we keep using it. Because I'm seeing more and more use of bank. Where I used to, when I started, I never saw bank used. Bank was that. We don't touch that. We're going to wait. Is it on the no, no, it's not highly addictive, it's just highly effective. So once doctors get tired of chasing wellness or trying to chase the infection, they just go, if, they, if it comes up as MRSA now, there, there's no genomycin first, it's vancomycin. Let's go. Let's just skip all that. Let's just go straight to bank. Let's give them bank. Let's give them five doses of bank. Okay. So then what happens? What, what's the story? How's it going to go? What do y'all think? The book says it becomes toxic. Yeah, it can become toxic, but we're talking about resistance. We're talking about staff aureus figuring out yeah. how to fight the bank. Right now it can't. Okay. So it is the drug of choice for methicillin resistant staph aureus. The hospital acquired the nosocomial infection only used to get when you went to the hospital and had some kind of procedure done. Right? That staph. And now VANC spectrum of activity. So should what? If we have a UTI, are we getting vancomycin? Hopefully not. Could we? Could we? Could bank be prescribed for UTI? Hope not, right? So there has to be some kind of, hopefully, what? If we tell you it's a gram negative organism, like Pseudomonas in the wound, that you're not giving the patient vancomycin, right? Only after we tell you it's MRSA in the wound, are you giving the patient vancomycin? Hopefully that connection's made. So there's gotta be some stops along the way. There has to be some pharmacy help. There has to be some microbiology help and there has to be some nursing help, right? And there has to be medical staff help. There has to be some checks. So when we say we're doing an, an antibiogram at the end of each month to let the physicians know what organisms we found this month and what they prescribed for it and did we how many MRSA cases did we have and how many MRSA cases got vancomycin that's the kind of info that needs to be analyzed and used and stewardship you just need to keep informed and how I, I can't tell you how easy it is not to do an antibiogram Oh, why should we do that? That takes some work. Why do I need to keep tabs of resistant organisms and who that patient has, right? Because we, we do what? When we have MRSA in the hospital, when that patient comes in and has a MRSA case, we isolate them in the hospital. I don't know if I've told you this story or not. But when we had MRSA come from the nursing home, we couldn't isolate them in the nursing home. That's against the rules of a nursing home. It's supposed to be a living 
normal living, not isolated living. It's not the hospital. So the patient would bounce back and forth. The patient came to the hospital. We isolated them for contact isolation. They went back to the nursing home. It was back to normal. So we kept seeing it over and over and over. MRSA said it spread to every wound. Every patient that came from the nursing home had MRSA. All right. So the mode of action of VANC is the same as our beta lactams inhibits cell wall synthesis. What it does is it forms a complex with the terminal acetyl D alanine D alanine side chain of the peptidoglycan and prevents cross linking. Remember that step? What step was that in our cell wall synthesis? What step was the peptidoglycan chain linking, cross linking? Three? Three, four? What was it? What? The last three? Was that three or four? Three? Three? Okay. All right, so vancomycin is messing with the cell wall too. There it is in all its beauty. I think it's on the backdrop of all the slides today. All right, so that's the cell wall. How we do it? Hanging in there with me? Are you excited to finally get this main antibiotics? Yes, you are. I can see it in your faces. I can see y'all just can't wait till we get to lab today. Get to do this. So uh, we'll move our way. I know what slide are we on? Does anybody know? I think we have about 70 slides. Where are we right now? 28. 28. I don't think we're going to get to 70 today, are we? Okay. <laughs> You're like, yeah, he drug that out on purpose. He just wanted it's more days to talk about this stuff. Well, let's talk about, let's, let's move through another group, and I think we'll, we'll be time to end after this group, but let's go ahead and let's get past the beta lactams. Let's get to the polymyxins. These are polypeptide antibiotics, the structure. The spectrum of activity, we have polymyxin B and E. Polymyxin B is a gra for gram-negative bacteria, especially Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So we know that one, right? We have that one over on our list. I think we do. We grew it out, didn't we? Wasn't this the, uh, the fruity smelling one or the tortilla chip one? Which one? Remember him? Remember Pseudomonas? Pseudomonas aeruginosa, a gram negative rod, oxidase positive, beta hemolytic, grape odor. Yeah, I love grape odor, I like that. Okay, polymyxin B for pseudomonas, colistin, polymyxin E, antibiograms for identification of gram-negative bacteria. What is VCNT for our Thayer Martin? We, we played with Thayer Martin, right? Modified Thayer Martin media, what did it have in it? Test review time. What, what made it, what, was, what did we use it for anyway? What organism did we use to make sure we had it growing on? It helped one of our organisms grow on. M to you know, modify it there, Martin. Aided in the growth of uh, Zoom. Y'all help me. What we got? Zoom hadn't been very helpful lately. Not to put pressure on Rachel and Brandy and Tristan. Modified there, Mark. What, how about VCNT? Let's start there. I'm going to say the C is colistin. I'm going to help you out with one of them. <laughs> V's vancomycin. <laughs> yes. N is who? 
how to say it. Huh? I don't know how to say it. It's N Y S T A T I N. Not statin? That one. Yes. How about T? Give it a shot. Come on. Um, um, I don't know. But it's something lactate. Lactate. Yes. T lactate? Maybe. No, that's not it. No help. Nobody's helping. Okay. Why do we add that to Thayer Martin? What did that do? What organism, if it was growing on Thayer Martin, we knew what it was presumptively because nothing else could grow in that setting, right? What was that organism? Oh, it's one of our big ones. Nice. How about that? Did y'all all know that just weren't talking? that hopefully that was the case. Okay. <laughs> there look at polymixin B. Wow. Right. So I know what you're asking, right? Are we gonna have to know the chemical structures of all these antibodies? And the answer is of course, yes, you should. So y'all get drawing tonight. Start studying these drawings. Could, could you make you know, like make it out right like I knew like I think that's bank behind us there I don't know all right poly mixin polyenes and I think this will be the last one we we talk about and we'll stop after this one's 1206 so should be about right Polyenes are a spectrum. They inhibit organisms whose membranes. Remember, these are cell membrane antibiotics. That's the way we're setting them up right now. We just did cell wall. Now we're into the cell membranes. Inhibits organisms whose membranes contain sterols, eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotes are our yeast and molds. So the polyenes would be used for that. They're not prokaryotic antibiotics. They do not have sterols in their cell membrane, so they are not used. Side effects is nephrotoxic, meaning they're toxic to our kidneys. They can be. So you wouldn't want to give somebody that's in decreased kidney function these, okay? So we don't want that. Amphotericin B is the only polyene routinely used because all others are insoluble or unstable. So amphotericin B, the polyene, I guess it would be used, I'm just running out here on a limb, that yeast and molds would be where they would go. Another one to start drawing, right? Y'all thought chemistry class was just awesome, right? I never it. You never got that far? Like half that size. Could, could you write out, I know y'all probably had to write out the, the, what is it, the empirical formula where you put how many C's, how many H's, and how many O's in organics. Anybody want to go for that? Anybody want to write that one out? You can got a nitrogen in here too. Okay, the polyenes, of course, amphotericin B, most widely used antifungal agent we have for systemic fungal infection. So that would be amphotericin if it's gone past what? The skin. Nystatin, you remember that awful, you know, between the toe, you know, athlete's foot one we were talking about earlier, nystatin for antifungal, Sup treats superficial infections of the skin and mucous membranes. All right, so we're gonna come back with the azoles. We'll come back and pick it up on Thursday there, 12.10. So I think that's, you need to let your brains rest a little bit before we head into micro today. Y'all got any questions? Where are these listed in the book? Like I found polymixins B. They're in that chapter. Believe it or not, we have one small chapter for this in the book. 
It's, it's difficult to swallow sometimes with that. You want the limit in the mouth. Okay. See y'all downstairs. I'm going to end. Uh, we're going to stop it. Days old. That's 36, so we made about halfway. We'll stop the share, and we'll end the meeting. See you guys later. <laughs>